basically, in, in this talk, as Keith said, I'm going to focus on the phenomenological aspects of dynamical dark matter. Keith talked a lot about the theory and about the cosmology and about some of the, um, and, we sh and he showed that there exist explicit models that one can build in certain contexts like um, theories with large extra dimensions in which you can construct a DDM ensemble that's cosmologically, experimentally, whatever you, whatever you want, viable. Um, in, so in this talk, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to be talking about some of the phenomenological implications that occur throughout the, the spectrum of different kinds of models that exist within the dynamical dark matter framework. I'm not going to focus on one model. I'm not going to focus on the axion model that, that Keith presented at the end. I'm going to give you basically a lot of interesting phenomenological handles that one could use to discover or see evidence of a non-minimal dark sector that takes the form of a dynamical dark matter ensemble experimentally within the coming decade. So just to kind of recap um, what Keith said, in dynamical dark matter, and this is the framework in general, not in any particular model, the dark matter candidate is an ensemble, it's an aggregate. It consists of a vast number of constituent particle species, and it's the collective behavior of these species that, that in its transcending the behavior of traditional dark matter candidates is going to give rise to some of these phenomenological signatures that we're going we're to be looking at here. Dark matter stability is not a requirement. so. Rather, the individual lifetimes and abundances are balanced against each other in such a way that all phenomenological, cosmological, astrophysical constraints are satisfied. And cosmological quantities, like the total dark matter relative abundance, the composition of the ensemble, even the equation of state, all of these exhibit a non-trivial time dependence beyond, of course, the usual time dependence associated with the expansion of the so again, Keith already showed a, a picture like this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But again, the idea is that in dynamical dark matter cosmology, which Keith focused on, the big picture is that the dark matter abundance today is split between a number, a, in fact, a very large number of different ensemble constituents. And there are, of course, other constituents that would have been part of the same ensemble had they not decayed in the past. These had shorter lifetimes, and those particles in the ensemble which have longer lifetimes, longer than the present age of the universe, are still around to contribute non-trivially to the dark matter relative abundance today. So this is, again, um, the, fact, the fact that things are going scaling like this. Um, is it this balancing between decay widths and abundances um, that, that Keith talked about? And again, there's nothing special about the present time here. This is just one slice in time. Dark matter was decaying before, during, and after the present epoch, and anything consistent with constraints goes. OK, so in Keith's talk, he focused on the general features of DDM and how to characterize the cosmology of DDM ensembles. In this talk, I'll be talking about the phenomenological consequences of DDM and some of the experimental signatures that can arise within the DDM framework. And in particular, I'll talk about methods of distinguishing these DDM ensembles at colliders, at direct detection experiments, at, and at indirect detection experiments, and in particular, cosmic ray detectors. And I'm here going to focus on AMS and the uh, positron signal that uh, Pamela and um, other experiments have been reporting for years. And AMS is just the latest, most precision experiment to weigh in. Okay, so as far as how can one, so the question really boils down to if the, dark, if the dark matter takes the form of a dynamical dark matter ensemble, how can we figure that out experimentally? So um, the ways of discovering and differentiating DDM, um, there are actually a number of experiment, uh, experimental ways of doing this, um, and one can do it in a number of different contexts. For example, with the LHC, um, this is a, a paper that uh, Keith and Shufang Su at the University of Arizona um, and I wrote back in, in 2012. Um, there are, so basically, there are a lot of these, the commonality between a lot of the different detection strategies has to do with the fact that with an ensemble, an, ex, an extended aggregate dark sector, aggregate dark matter candidate, the kinematics 
of dark matter in terms of what it does in colliders after it's produced, the, kin the kinematic variables that you use to um, identify what's going on at the LHC or at other, at other particle colliders, um, the kinematics of direct detection experiments, and that's the recoil energy spectra of the, uh, the recoiling nuclei, and um, the flux spectra at indirect detection experiments, gamma ray flux spectra, um, positron flux spectra, flux spectra of whatever cosmic ray, other cosmic ray particle you're interested in, all of these can have very different kinematics than they do in the standard in standard traditional dark matter, you know, dark matter theories. Or Oops, theories so the, the assumption I think is again that the daughters are pure standard model particles. It's not like a parent particle is decaying to standard model particles plus the next level of dark matter for this plus. That, that I'm both of those possible both of those are Possibilities. Yeah, but yeah, for these plots, uh, you know, uh, which possibility? Okay, so for these possibilities, I'm talking about the case of a parent particle decaying into standard model so, plus yeah. um, um, dynamical dark matter constituents. And of course, there are other model independent dark matter searches. You can also look at kinematics and mono, and mono anything searches and things like that. But I'm just going to focus on this as an example. These are three examples, I should say. There are a lot of other ways. Um, this is by no means exhaustive. Um, so in in um, so basically, as as you were saying, uh, as Bhaskar was saying, constituent fields in the ensemble can be produced alongside standard model particles by the decays of additional heavy fields, and evidence of an EDM ensemble can be ascertained from the characteristic features that we're seeing here, and I'll elaborate on this in more detail later on. Um, imprinted on um, on various kinematical kinematic variable spectra, for example, the invariant mass spectra of a pair of jets that are produced alongside a dark matter particle from some decaying parent particle. Um, at direct detection experiments, the relevant um, kinematic spectra are the recoil energy spectra, as I said, of the recoiling nuclei. And um, these distinctive features, um, and distinctive features like this um, unusually shaped curve um, here, um, can appear at direct detection experiments, and uh, one can use those again to differentiate dynamical dark matter ensembles from traditional dark matter. Finally, indirect detection um, through um, cosmic rays, photons, other things from out there in the universe um, can also um, give us a handle through, again, kinematical spectra of um, whether or not your dark sector really looks like a dynamical dark matter ensemble or a traditional dark matter candidate. These ensembles can reproduce the observed positron data from AMS, this is one example, while satisfying constraints from all other astrophysical constraints on decaying dark matter. And moreover, DDM models of the positron excess um, also give rise to concrete predictions for the behavior of these spectra at high energies. Um, as we'll see, the constraints that exist in, um, in these scaling relations on particular models of, of dynamical dark matter give a very taut prediction for what should happen at higher energies um, as AMS releases more data um, over the next few years. These are, again, just three examples that illustrate the observable effects that DDM ensembles give rise to. There are, um, of course, other possibilities, and I'll highlight them um, when possible offhand. But let's turn to examine some of these um, some of these different phenomenological ways of distinguishing dynamical dark matter in detail and see how they work. So, so uh, one question. So uh, for the uh, AMS one, uh, the proton uh, uh, piece is still a problem. It all, you are assuming just it's a pure lepton. Right. It, um, in, in this case, we're assuming pure decays to leptons, and therefore the, the anti-proton okay. constraints are, are really, really small. And we check them, in fact, and they're obscenely small. When, when you calculate like this and even the direct detection for the local density of dark matter, are you like, weighting it for the different candidates that are ensemble or ah, are you going to talk about that at all? Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Now there are a lot of different, now there are a lot of different subtleties involved in, in, in exactly how the abundance is locally compared to the abundances globally. In most of what I'll do here, I'm going to be assuming for direct detection, just for simplicity's sake, that the local abundances are proportional to the global cosmological abundances. Of course, depending on what the kinematics of the dark matter is, and um, for, for example, you can imagine a different distribution 
um, of each dark matter candidate within the galactic halo. I mean, I was, for example, depending on all these, there's yeah. these models of double disk dark matter where you have one that decays and one doesn't, and you sort of naturally have this right into the system. Yeah, exactly. We are we are not gonna we are not gonna go into that here. But again, that's another that's another possibility that could be inherent in a framework like this. Yeah. So yeah, we're not uh, not going to do any of the any of the double disk stuff here, or uh, or weight things in terms of mass, in terms of different um, different profiles. Um, but uh, yeah, you'll you'll see in more detail what we do. I'll talk a little bit about it. So um, how to distinguish dynamical dark matter at the LHC? <clears throat> well, um, so first of all, um, the starting point is. Um, we'll start by um, examining a particular scenario, which is that, um, as motivated by a wide variety of um, beyond the standard extensions of the standard model, um, dark sector fields are often um, produced by the decays of some additional heavy parent particle that's also in the theory, um, top partners, other things that are motivated by the hierarchy problem, of course, um, might be things that you want in a theory, so having a parent particle that's in the theory is not a crazy idea. Strongly interacting psi, furthermore, can be produced copiously at the LHC um, because they have strong interactions. Um, so SU3 color invariance requires that if I have such a psi, it needs to decay to a final state that involves not only dark sector fields alone, but also some combination of standard model quarks and or gluons as well. And in scenarios like this, um, we would ex um, expect the initial signals of dark matter to generically appear at the LHC in channels involving jets and missing energy. Heavy parent particles decay to jet, decay to quarks and gluons, they become jets, and um, there's missing energy from the dark particles. So further information, however, after this, an initial excess in these channels is observed. Further information about the dark sector particles can also be gleaned by looking at the kinematic distributions of certain visible particles produced alongside the, dark, the uh, DM particles. And the idea I have in mind here is a parent particle decaying to some set of standard model states, including hadronic jets, if this is color, and dark sector fields as well, some number of them. And as we'll see, um, this information can be very effective in distinguishing DM ensembles from traditional dark matter candidates. So um, for concreteness and tractability, let's begin by considering a dark sector, which includes a traditional dark matter candidate, just for, for contrast here, a stable dark matter particle with mass m chi. And let's consider the case in which you have a parent particle, and it decays primarily by a three-body process. Psi goes to a pair of jets and chi. So this is kind of an analog of a uh, glumino decaying down to a, uh, a neutralino in Susie through via some optional score or something. So invariant mass distributions for such decays manifest a characteristic shape. In particular, there's a, a mass edge, um, which um, is located at around the mass of the located at the mass of the parent particle minus the mass of the dark matter particle. And so you have these characteristic particular um, invariant mass distributions depending on what the value of m chi is. And of course, different coupling structures between psi, chi, and the standard metal quarks or gluons, depending on whether the, this is a scalar, this is a fermion, et cetera, whether I'm emitting quarks or gluons. All of this has a little bit of an effect on, on the shape of this, but not terribly much for the purposes that I'm going to be talking about here. So eff effectively, um, the important thing really is what the mass of the dark matter particle is, and the fact that I have this decay topology. So the so um, it's a digit mass distribution of the digit. Yep. So I'm so psi, each psi digit. psi is decaying to digit, um, a pair of jets and chi, and I'm just focusing on one side of the event and looking at the pair of jets that's being produced by psi decay and the invariant mass thereof. Okay. So one side of the decay. Okay. So one side one side of the decay. Of course, when you start introducing both sides, you have to be a little bit um, be a little bit careful. And actually, we're work, we're working with some of the folks um, who are actually on the Atlas collaboration at the University of Arizona with trying to make this a little with trying to make this a little bit more rigorous for the uh, multiple for when you're including both sides of the decay. So um, that's that's in the works. But the important thing here is for I mean, for example, there are there are ways of dealing with. 
dealing with this. For example, if the side decays on one side to a pair of B quarks, and maybe you can use maybe you can use B tagging to separate the two. Um, there, there are a lot of ways to do this. Um, but the important thing is, no matter the, what really matters here in the results that I'm going to show you, really depends on there's a certain production rate for the parent particle psi, and then it's looking at the kinematics of the decays, the branching fractions, what they do to these invariant, what they do to these invariant mass spectra. So really, essentially, peer production is one mechanism that could produce a parent particle, but any other production mechanism that even might produce one of these things singly still is fine. So whatever parent particle I have that decays this way, however I make it, any of this applies. Pair production is just the simplest, easiest thing that comes to mind first. So let's see what happens, how the situation changes when I talk about a DEM ensemble instead. Well, in general, the constituent particles and other fields of the theory couple through some sort of effective operators um, to, um, my, to my state which couple my standard model fields to my dark center particles. Something, something like that, where D sub A is just the uh, mass, um, this is just the mass dimension of the operator. I have some suppression scale lambda, and these are just operator coefficients. So as an example, let's consider a theory which, in which the coupling is just like it was in the, in the, the previous slide. So I'm trying to have a parent particle decay to two, jet, uh, two particles that initiate jets, and a, uh, a constituent in the dynamical dark matter ensemble. And let's parameterize the ensemble as follows. So um, we're going to take these to be our, our scaling relations, basically. So the, the uh, operator coefficients here, the operator coefficient for each field, um, alpha just labels the operator, n labels the particular constituent in the DEM ensemble, starting with m equals 0. Um, that's chi zero, the lightest field in the ensemble, and we'll label them in order of increasing mass. And so um, we're just gonna we're gonna take um, the scaling relation to be um, the, that that um, the operator coefficient goes like the operator coefficient of the lightest one times m n over m zero. These are the masses of the of field n and, and the lightest field to the power of some scaling index we'll call gamma. And the mass and the mass spectrum we're going to assume takes this form, where n zero is the mass of the lightest constituent, n again is the uh, the number that labels the mode, and delta is a scaling index that basically tells you about the density of states. So, it, for example, um, and delta m is this mass splitting parameter here. So the idea here is that if delta is greater than one, that means you're getting greater and greater and greater and greater mass splittings as you go up the tower. If delta is less than one, between one and zero, your states are getting more and more densely packed as you go up the tower. So this is the kind of mass spectrum we're gonna focus on. Let's see what happens. Well, the, the first most immediate consequence is um, it, it occurs on the, or to the branching fractions of the parent particle. So once again, let's consider the simplest non-trivial case that we can where psi couples to each of the chi, um, chi sub n, these dark matter constituents, via a four Fermi interaction of the form here. So Q, uh, Q, Q bar, these are just standard model quarks. Here's the parent particle, and here's the, uh, here's the dark matter constituent. So we'll assume that the parent's total decay width is dominated by decays um, initiated by the, this operator of the form chi goes to jj, uh, psi goes to jj chi sub n. And so the branching fractions, um, the, we can um, so let's examine their, their behavior or how they vary as a function of gamma and delta. So here in this plot, um, I'm showing the branching fraction of psi goes to jj chi sub n. Um, as a as a plot as a function of although this is, this is a discrete variable n the the number that labels the mode remember this is just the number that labels the mode not the mass of the mode so when gamma is very very small and again remember gamma um, when gamma is very very small meaning less than less than zero here that means the couplings are gamma less than zero means the couplings are decreasing as I go up and up and up the tower 
Um, this means basically I'm essentially decaying almost entirely to the lightest mode in the tower, to, to the n equals zero mode. And as gamma increases, however, I start decaying more and more and more to the higher modes. So I get to this orange curve here for gamma equals minus one, get to this green curve here. Then when I get to gamma being greater than zero, um, of course, I that means the couplings to the heavier and heavier and heavier modes are bigger and bigger and bigger. But of course, when I get to some high n, there's also a kinematic suppression. There's phase space suppression. Um, and eventually, I completely run out of phase space when I get to particles that are as heavy as the parent particle. And so that gives you this rise and fall here. What, so, what are you assuming about lambda? It just like it's T or something? So lambda, keep in mind, these are the branching <coughs> fractions. So lambda is going into the overall decay width. None of this depends on lambda whatsoever. So lambda, all I'm assuming is that lambda is sufficiently large that these things are, so that lambda is, um, so lambda is, um, for example, su su sorry, sufficiently small so that these things are decaying on collider timescales. But that's about all I really need to assume. As long as I don't have a displaced vertex or anything else, uh, as long as these are prompt by my... Yep. So, um, uh, the, the lambda picture, uh, you know, it's but you don't necessarily need those heavier states that are so so unstable that you inside the factor. I mean, so if you get some constraint on these heavier states, so how does this existence of those heavier states help with your dynamic picture? Does it really do anything to your dynamic picture? Okay, so so keep in mind that the states that are decaying inside the detector are the size, the the parent particle, which is not part of the DDM ensemble. Uh, the chi's themselves are cosmologically stable up into are cosmologically stable up into whatever you know this interaction would cause, yeah, and it's easy to yeah, make, to uh, banish that, that to make them very high. That's the, the only the, the largest one mainly from the many different letters. That was a component of your doc, dynamic dark matter. But you get some constraint on the lambda from the lighter constraint. Right. So, but the, the, how does this lambda help with your dynamic picture? I mean, how does it help with the, some property of the lightest one? Oh, no. So, as far as far as the the property of the lightest one, um, doesn't that ne doesn't necessarily. So, the lightest one, for example, might be in this case, the lightest one could be absolutely stable, or the lightest one could have, there could be some other operator in the theory that's more suppressed and it could decay via that operator solely. So we're not assuming that this, so this clearly is something that, um, is, this clearly is not something that necessarily will make the lightest guy in my ensemble decay. <coughs> okay. Because the, the psi particle is heavier, so. Yeah, this operator is not, Intrinsically part of the whole theory that I was talking about. Right. The size, the chi ends are from that theory. Okay. Yeah. And now he's psi is just an additional thing. through this kind of coupling. Uh, uh, yes, I uh, understand. But, but, but if this is, if this coupling exists, you can test them. Right. But your theory doesn't require this. Correct. It did not. Okay. It did not. Right. Okay. That is correct. Right. The o the only thing is that is that this puts some constraints on the lifetimes, and those are satisfiable. But, but again, that's not more or less of an assumption than one normally makes with dark matter, right? I mean, it could have been gravitationally interacting only, and you wouldn't really produce it in a collider either. One assumes that one could, I mean, if it's a wimp in some fashion, then you do have operators like that, but if one doesn't have that. Right, saying. so again, the same thing is, if you could detect it, what might it look like? So the presumption is, if you could detect it, so there's the operator that says you can detect it. Right. Just that between this uh, detectable sector doesn't really change much. To your no, that's correct. That, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So okay. Um, what, what, what Brooks is really going to do here is explore the kinematics, the change in kinematics. If you replace the usual dark matter candidate with an ensemble. This is a much more. What? This much more. Yeah, an ensemble means, yes. multiple, ensemble means a collection yeah. of multiple things. So there are multiple different chi n here that psi can decay to. And the that's the ensemble. The assumption that there's a Not particle psi. and it causes a decay, that's the standard kind of thing that people do always. Okay. And so this is just the replacement 
of the dark matter single particle with the ensemble into the general framework and ask what then would collide signals change to look like. Yeah. And another thing I should say is because, as you point out, that the whole dark matter picture doesn't change much with, with psi, that means that this a lot of this can really be extended even beyond dynamical dark matter. And really, a lot of what I'm going to show you pretty much applies to any multi-component dark matter theory um, that has a coupling like this, which is dynamical dark matter. There's nothing to sound. <laughs> but, but anyhow. OK, you can also look at how, um, how things scale um, with delta. Um, I won't spend too much time on this just because of time, but um, you, you can see that when delta when delta is very large, that means that the splitting between the, the lightest guy and the next to lightest guy is kind of small. And then there's a huge splitting until you get to the, the next guy. So when delta is very big, you only have a couple of states that are kinematically accessible. Here are your couple of states. Everybody else, the branching graphic chain to them is, is very, very small. Um, however, when delta gets much and much, 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 much smaller, you have an increase, um, you have a increased density of states as you get to higher and higher and higher end, and a lot of modes kinematically accessible that are heavier. So there, there's just a there are a lot of heavier modes, and so Paul the so I should mention that while in a situation like this, where I have delta being um, something like 0 0.5, this curve here, although the branching fraction to each individual mode out here is small, the density of states is big. So the branching fraction to modes with masses between, say, the mass of this guy and the mass of this guy is getting pretty big. And that will actually come, um, come in Handy so as far delta as it. m you fix it to be 50 GeV for uh, like the, all the uh, masses you have produced. Right? Like the delta m equals to 50 GeV means uh, what? Ah, okay. Delta delta m remember is this. Um, sorry, delta m is this ah, constant okay. mass splitting parameter here. So it's constant. the prefactor of that. So delta m is a delta m is a constant and. Yeah, you can see the role of delta here. So delta is not a mass splitting between adjacent levels. Yeah. I, I, may call, I may call it a mass splitting parameter but because it controls a mass splitting, but I... So I, what, uh, what's the typical mass splitting? Because now if it's, if it's the parameter, so what's the typical mass splitting magnitude here? I'll show you. Um, usually on the order of 50 to a few hundred GeV oh. is, is what you can well, to see in colliders. Yeah, just to say, the values of gamma and delta, uh -huh. he's allowing them to be arbitrary yeah, yeah. because we don't want to restrict yeah. ourselves to a particular model. Yeah. But yeah, for KK possible. theories, for KK yeah. theories, well, that it's gives you a gamma, it gives you a delta. Scale, that times times yeah, there'll be very specific values. So this is just an exploration of the DDM parameter space. Mm -hmm. No, why I'm asking because uh, it has some. Um, are very interesting implications for the frequency sciences. What? It has very interesting implications for the LHC sciences. Oh, yes. for the LHC sciences. Oh, you bet. Yeah, and That's you'll it. you'll see a few of them in a minute. Okay. So what do these do to invariant mass distributions? Okay. So evidence of a DDM ensemble can be ascertained from characteristic features that end up being imprinted on these kinematic distributions because of these decay patterns that exist for the heavy parent particle. So in particular, um, I'm showing in these plots here, so three different panels with different values of the model parameters. And in each of these panels, the different curves here, these are the invariant mass distributions, and the different curves correspond to different values of this mass splitting parameter which isn't the same as the mass splitting as we just discussed, delta m. 600 GeV is the red curve, and so on and so forth, as you can see here. So um, for the scenarios, um, and so in these scenarios, um, I don't know if you can, uh, I don't know if the resolution's good enough for you to see this, but this is gamma equals minus one, so small gamma regime, gamma equals zero, gamma equals one, so large gamma regime. Couplings are, are increasing as I get further over here as I go up and up and up the tower even more um, 
with each pair. So these uh, kings, what I see, are they because of this, uh, you have a JPT, minimum JPT? No, in fact, it's a completely, it's a completely different thing. So what are these kinks? Let me explain the kinks, because the kinks are a big part of this. Okay, so when I start with small gamma, you'll notice that, okay, the black curve is a single dark matter candidate. That's, that's my straw man right here. Okay, you can't even see the black curve because it's buried underneath the red curve. I mean, so, so many of these are so close for small gamma to the standard case where you don't really, you can hardly even tell them apart. However, when gamma increases, What's going on? The couplings to the heavier modes are increasing, and the branching fractions to the heavier modes are increasing. So, with a, a mass splitting of around 600 GeV, all right, if, M, um, if M0 is 200 GeV, which as you can see in this, in this plot, this means that my lowest two states, one is 200 GeV in mass, my next dark matter state up is 800 GeV. And so, for a 1500 GeV dark matter particle, one would expect to see if the branching ratios for these two, these two particles are commensurate, or, or to the heavier one is bigger because gamma is getting large, basically two different invariant mass spectra almost superimposed on each other. One, which peaks at around 1500 minus 200 is 1300, one where the edge is around 1500 minus 800 is 700. So what you're seeing here is basically two invariant mass spectra laying on top of each other. And so these kinks like this are a distinctive feature that, as you can see, as I get to bigger and bigger gamma, these become even more amplified. The branching fraction here, since gamma is big for the, uh, to the second mode in this red curve case, um, is, is even bigger, you get an even more pronounced um, blob here. So this is, this is really one way of, of being able to distinguish things. And actually, I'll show you another way of being able to distinguish things in this slide um, when I show you uh, the effect of increasing delta. So um, in, in this slide here, I'm, when I'm, I'm changing gears a little bit, the different curves represent different choices of gamma, and now I'm varying delta. Delta is 0 0.5, um, 1, and uh, is that 2? Yeah, 2 here. So what's going on in the small delta? So OK, for delta equals 2, we were seeing something that looked very much kind of like this, um, in the sense that there were a few widely spaced modes. And you are seeing multiple different kinks, um, of course, depending on how big gamma is. If gamma is really small, like it is with this red curve, you're not going to see much. But if gamma is big enough, you're going to be able to see these kinks. However, when delta gets small, and you have a lot of different modes that are very, very closely packed together, especially as you get to large n, so the heavier modes are very, very close, patently packed together. Um, if delta m is if delta m is reasonably small, and here it's um, only 200 GeV, what you're seeing is effectively a situation where all of these different mass edges blend together into sort of a collective bell shape. So the two characteristic signatures that allow you to distinguish these things are, first of all, having multiple distinguishable peaks like we're seeing here, and then this collective bell shape that we're seeing here, which is characteristic of small values of delta m and or small values of delta. So what's the typical mass difference for the collective bell shape like between among states? So basically, um, it depends a little bit, um, because both delta and delta m have something to do with it. It depends a little bit on delta. But the collective bell, I mean, literally, as a, literally it's when you're if, if you get to a point where your mass rate, where the resolution of your jet energy is small, the, um, is bigger than the um, spacing for the invariant mass, basically, basically. Um, the, or sorry, the spacing between um, the different different particle masses, things will kind of bleed together into a bell. It's when you can't resolve. It's when you can't resolve. The greatness of the ensemble. So basically, this this is what our, this is what happens in. This is what happens in that regime. And of course, it's an interplay between delta and delta m. OK, 
So how, so all right, that's all, that's all fun and happy, but how well can we really distinguish these, these things in practice? In other words, to what degree are the characteristic kinematic distributions to which these ensembles <coughs> give rise truly distinctive in the sense that any traditional dark matter candidate that you might possibly think might reproduce those curves can't do a good job of that. Well, okay, in order to do that, what we really should be doing is essentially comparing a particular curve that we get from a dynamical dark matter ensemble to all of the different possibilities that exist within the theory space of single component models. Well, that's actually not that difficult to do, although it may sound, it may sound like a, uh, there are, there's a huge space of models, but not really. Um, in fact, really, because as I've already discussed, the, the coupling structures, as long as I'm decaying to two jets and a dark matter particle, the coupling structure really doesn't affect the shape of the curve all that much. Um, surveying over traditional dark matter particles with different masses, m chi, is really pretty much all that you need to do to get a, an effective sample and really show that you're, you're really compare your dark matter, uh, dynamical dark matter ensembles curve to all of the different spectrum of possibilities that exist within traditional dark matter models. So in practice, we just take our invariant mass distributions here. We divide them into bins determined by the invariant mass resolution, delta mjj of the detector. This is dominated by the jet energy resolution, as I was saying a little min uh, minute or so ago. For each value of m chi in the survey, we define a chi-squared statistic, um, depending on the mass, to define the degree to which the two resulting invariant mass distributions differ. And the minimum chi-squared from all of these represents the degree to, a DDM on, to which a DDM ensemble can be distinguished from any traditional dark matter candidate. In any words, the one that gives you the best fit between a tradi the traditional dark matter model that you're surveying, that you're including in your survey, and your DDM ensemble is the one that you pick. So how well can you go to distinguishing, um, go toward distinguishing dynamical dark, dark matter ensembles at the LHC? We, well, actually, really quite well. So the plots I'm showing you here, um, I'll explain these in a minute. Um, I'm plotting, um, and these are just surveying at the parameter space. Um, this is gamma, the coupling scaling exponent. This is delta, um, the uh, mass spectrum scaling exponent. And I'm showing you results for delta m equals 50 to 100 and 500 g. V. Um, so these are results assuming that I have a that I have a thousand signal events collected for um, pair production for PT goes to psi psi for a TeV scale parent particle, and this is with an integrated luminosity of 30 inverse femto barns at the upgraded um, 14 TeV when we did this analysis at LHC. So um, in this case, again, I'm picking a 1500 GeV parent particle mass and setting M0 to 200 GeV in each case. And what these plots show is the statistical significance of differentiation. And what I mean by that is I do a chi-squared fit. I compare this to a chi-squared distribution. I get a p-value. I compare that to the, the p-value of a Gaussian distribution, and I calculate what my equivalent Gaussian statistical significance is. And the point, of, point here is that for regions where gamma is bigger than zero and, del and um, delta M and or delta are pretty small, you get large regions of parameter space where you get a five sigma significance or greater. So these are situations where if you were to, at the LHC, start seeing evidence in the uh, start seeing evidence in, in the appropriate channels, and collected a thousand signal events, which is um, appropriate for a TEV scale psi of something like of 1500 GeV. In fact, um, you actually can go a long way to distinguishing dynamical dark matter ensembles from traditional dark matter candidates, and showing that your dark sector really does look non-minimal in this way. There's um there's no degeneracy if you like introduce next to lightest super partner and next to next to lightest super partner and push the scales down and stuff. You can't mimic the same. 
Well, in that case, you really do have a multi. I mean, if you really do yeah. have a bunch of long live, um, it's basically exactly yeah, slug, the same. I mean, yeah, long live neutralinos. I mean, I exactly. That's basically the same sort of thing. But that's exactly what we're looking for. Okay. We're looking for we're looking for deviations from traditional single dark matter particle. And if I have a very compressed spectrum of a conjillion neutralinos and all 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 right there, yeah, no, I'll, I'll see the same thing too. And that's exactly what we're looking for. That, that falls under the same same sort of heading. Right, exactly. But this is fairly divorced from cosmology. Right, but to say this is DDM, there's still an added statement about the abundances, which is relevant. Right. Okay. So, um, and this is just, I won't linger on this, this is just showing the results in a different slice of parameter space for delta m and delta. So, um, to read that comment, can I turn it around now and be a little bit mean then? So, what, what that means is you can't use collider data to distinguish between dynamical dark matter, which would have a different scaling, and just like a we know to you know, something called dark matter oh, complementarity. Yeah. Yes. But I mean exactly. But that's, that's a great idea. But that's, <laughs> no, <laughs> but that's no different than the usual I mean don't hold DDM to a higher standard than regular dark matter. There's there's nothing that you could ever learn about cosmological abundances. Yeah, I mean, you might. I mean, keep in mind that if you see a missing energy signal, you don't even know if that's dark matter, right? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, so you are not chasing the leptons in the same way you have chased the jets. No, one in principle could though. One could chase leptons. We we just um, we just did this as an example. One can chase leptons. One can chase all sorts of other kinds of decay yeah. Because uh, why I said leptons? Because in that case, delta m could be smaller. Yeah, that, that, yes, that's definitely true. That's everything you're saying is true. This was just one yeah. example one exam. as an existence proof because we hadn't yet written any paper that said anything about colliders and we wanted to have an existence proof. The world is open to taking any kind of model you want to look at, any kind of decay pattern you want to look at, any phenomenology, lepton, I mean, this, this need not stop. We don't, we, this was not meant to be exhaustive, this was an example. Mm -hmm. So everything exactly. you're saying is absolutely true. Yeah. Could be done. Oh yeah, should be done. So now I'm going to move to something that has a little bit more of the uh, direct um, cosmological and astrophysical handle. Um, this is how to distinguish dynamical dark matter at direct detection experiments. So direct detection experiments offer another possible method of distinguishing DDM ensembles. And again, it's kinematics. After the initial observation of an excess in signal events, so of course the first thing again is you find an excess, there's an overall excess in the event rate, the next thing you look at should be the shape of the recoil energy spectrum associated with these events. And this can provide additional properties about, um, additional information about the properties of the dark matter candidate. There are a lot of factors, of course, that impact the shape of a recoil energy spectrum and even a rate in general. So, a lot, some of these, um, and I've kind of, so this is the differential event rate here, the recoil energy spectrum. Um, and there are a horde of different considerations that feed into all of these different symbols that go into this. There are considerations from particle physics. There's, of course, the all-important kind nucleus scattering cross-section. The mass of the dark matter particle also matters. The reduced mass of the chi nucleon system appears here. All of this is particle, phys particle physics stuff. There's, of course, um, also nuclear physics. There's a nuclear form factor here. Um, in practice, there are a, a lot of uncertainties about um, certain, LA, certain aspects of certain nuclear form factors. So that's another, another thing that could, um, that, that's another factor that one has to take into account. There's the local energy density of the chi sub i, um, of the, or of the uh, chi sub j, assuming um, I have a bunch of different dark matter particles, I'm having to sum over all of them. There's the halo velocity distribution. We don't know what the phase space distribution is of the dark matter in the halo. Um, it could be an isothermal sphere, there could be streams, there could, it could be something else. And so there are a bunch of <coughs> astrophysics and cosmology factors in here too. So between par particle physics, nuclear physics, and astrophysics, there are all sorts of things that come into play here. There are a lot of uncertainties, and so as far as what I'm going to talk about about direct detection, um, my goal really here is to show how is to, to try to isolate and show what the differences are 
between the recoil energy spectra that you get from a DEM ensemble and the recoil energy spectra that you get from a traditional dark matter candidate holding everything else fixed. I want to I just look at the differences that result in that spectrum and the differences in direct detection phenomenology that result when you replace a traditional dark matter candidate with a DDM ensemble. Therefore, in each, therefore, I am going to just adopt, for these purposes, a standard set of assumptions about the particles in the dark matter halo, which, is, which are just part of the sort of standard picture of dark matter that people usually use when um, talking about um, bounds on or signals of dark matter um, from direct detection. In particular, I'm going to assume a total dark matter energy density um, locally of 0.3 GeV per centimeter cubed. I'm going to assume a maximal distribution for the halo velocities. I'm going to assume a local circular velocity of around 220 kilometers per second and a galactic escape velocity of 540 um, kilometers per second. I'm going to assume a uh, wood saxon type form factor, spin independent scattering dominates, isospin conservation, and I'm going to assume, as um, I, um, Scott mentioned earlier, that the local dark matter abundance, um, and this is a particular DDM type assumption, this is an assumption that doesn't need to be made in traditional dark matter models, that the local dark matter abundance of each field is proportional to its global dark matter abundance. So departures from the standard picture, all of them can have important consequences, but again, I want to examine the consequences of replacing a traditional dark matter candidate with a DDM ensemble. I want to focus on that here. And of course, you can talk about all of these uncertainties and things like that. But I want to look at what, what, is, tip, what is uniquely DDM um, in terms of its effects. So recoil energy spectra. What do traditional dark matter models give you? Let's, let's begin by looking at that first. Well, okay, so when a dark matter candidate chi scatters off an atomic nucleus n with mass m sub n, the recoil rate um, turns out to be exponentially suppressed for recoil energies that are, are greater than this blob of numbers here. So essentially, you get shapes that kind of fall like this. Of course, then you get these weird bounces and rises here. What this is, is just the, the effect of the nuclear form factor. We don't really understand nuclear form factors within certain very high energy regimes, so we tend to model them by Bessel functions and other things that have unphysical poles. And then we basically say, um, because we don't understand these unphysical poles, we're going to, um, if we're xenon or lux, ignore um, anything above 40 GeV in recoil energy and focus that as our recoil energy window for analysis. But the point is that um, for light dark matter particles, you have a very precipitous drop here um, in the recoil energy spectrum. Whereas for heavier and heavier dark matter particles, you have, thing, you have things that, um, you have curves that um, bow out much, much, much um, more gently. And things tend to look a little bit more similar. Um, the drop isn't as precipitous as you get to higher and higher and higher masses. So the low mass regime, Things are very sharply peaked at low recoil energies, and that's due to the velocity distribution. And the shape is quite sensitive to m, m chi. In the high mass regime um, up here, mass greater than around 20 or 30 GeV with a broad spectrum, and the shape isn't particularly sensitive to m chi. Of course, it is a little bit, but not, not as much. So what happens when you introduce a DDM ensemble and replace your traditional dark matter candidate with a set of, let's call them chi sub j, um, which um, all can scatter off atomic nuclei. Well, um, both, uh, first thing I'll say is that now, um, both elastic and inelastic scattering are possible, right? Because you have um, this, this state here and this state here could be different particles in the DDM ensemble. They could have different masses. So you could be in an inelastic or exothermic dark matter type of scenario. In other words, both down scattering, scattering of a heavier metastable dark matter candidate to a lighter one, the, what's often called exothermic dark matter is possible, as well as upscattering, scattering into a heavier state, which is the traditional sort of Weiner, Tucker, Smith um, type of, of um, inelastic dark matter. So in this talk, at the very, very, very end of the talk, I'll come back to the effects of inelastic scattering. But for now, let's focus on elastic scattering. Assume that the couplings here are such so that it, that elastic scattering for each component dominates. The overall overall recoil rate. 
So for concreteness, I'll focus on the case where the couplings between the chi sub j and the nucleons, and these are these, um, um, so these are, um, I'm going to focus on the spin, D, um, spin independent case, so the F sub n's, these are the effective um, couplings to neutrons and protons, which again I'm setting good equal to each other. Again, obey some sort of power law relation here, um, where I'm calling the, uh, the coupling exponent beta here. So again, it's mass of J over mass, mass of the lightest mode beta to the beta, and I'm going to assume the mass spectrum has exactly the same parameterization that I introduced for the collider stuff. So delta M, delta, all of that still holds. So this, of course, gives rise to a spin-independent um, cross-section for nucleon that, that looks like this. Okay, so um, the so just to make, uh, of course, um, in contrast to the collider analysis that I presented above, um, really this direct um, direct detection involves a real, true cosmological population of dark matter particles, some of which are in our galactic halo. So we the the omegas here do matter, whereas they didn't for colliders. You were actually producing the dark matter here. You're detecting dark matter particles in the halo. So um, this omega totes, the total dark matter part of dark matter relic abundance, which is the sum of these individual abundances here, and this parameter eta that Keith defined in his talk, um, I'm going to be using these. And recall that the cosmology of a given EDM ensemble is primarily characterized by these parameters. So I'm going to again consider, um, as I said, a, uh, a mass spectrum of this form. And again, we're going to consider that um, a case where omega sub j, the uh, relic abundance contribution from a given component scales like this with a, a given exponent alpha. And so one can look at eta, which uh, again is really this benchmark of how DDM-like um, the, the overall dark matter distribution is, whether it's one component dominating, that's eta equals zero, or whether it's um, the ensemble is really contributing. And you can see that um, for values of alpha that are between, say, around minus 5 and minus 1 here, and uh, delta m over m naught, uh, delta m over m naught of 1 here, um, there are, you get certainly throughout a large region of parameter space, you're getting order 1 numbers for eta. And throughout a large, even larger region of parameter space, you're getting even more order 1 numbers for eta when delta m is much smaller than m naught. So small mass splitting regime. So essentially, in this slide, I'm assuring you that the ensemble is really DDM-like for a lot of regions of the alpha, this alpha scaling parameter that we're interested in. So um, we're, we're really probing the full ensemble here. OK, so recoil energy spectra for dynamical dark matter ensembles. How do things change when I replace a traditional dark matter candidate with a DDM ensemble? Well, what happens is that distinctive features emerge in the recoil energy spectra due, again, to the kinematics of the scattering, where I have multiple different particles of different masses that can scatter off the nucleus. So especially um, when one or more of the chi sub j are in that low mass regime that I talked about, where the mass of the dark matter particle is around 20 to 30 GeV or less, you can get some very distinctive recoil energy spectra. So here, um, I'm showing you some of the recoil energy spectra um, for the parameter choice of alpha equals minus 1.5, beta equals minus 1, delta equals 1. Um, and we can see here, um, and these curves correspond to different values of the mass flooding delta m. So again, for small delta m, we see these distinctive shapes where your, the resolution in recoil energy of your detector is not necessarily good enough to discern different contributions from uh, different recoil energy spectra from different components, and you get this characteristic OG shape. That's what it's called, a curve that goes in and goes out. Architects study this. Um, anyhow, um, and when you get much, however, when you get much larger mass splittings, um, you get these um, kink behaviors where you're transfer, where down in this um, low mass regime, you're dealing with a, say, the lightest particle in the ensemble, and then the second lightest particle takes over here, and you could have a third and a fourth, and so on and so forth. But the point is that both of these um, OG shapes and um, recoil energy spectra with kinks are characteristic of DDM ensembles. I mean, here's one example of a traditional dark matter ensemble, but other 
Um, traditional dark matter ensembles will give you falling curves that look like this or look like this. They're not going to look like OGs and they're not going to have a king. So these are again very these are again two very distinctive behaviors that exist for um, DDM ensembles that traditional dark matter candidates just can't do. Now I'm showing you here for M0 equals 10 GeV when I increase things to M0 equals 30 GeV and definitely to 100 GeV. I'm getting much, much closer to everybody being in the high mass regime. And, when I'm, and remember I'm saying that pretty much recoil energy spectra from constituents that are in the high mass regime, they're not very different from one another. Um, and so your distinguishing power here at around 30, you start to lose it. And when you get to 100, everything, every recoil energy spectrum basically kind of looks like a, a traditional dark matter. Um, so I won't um, linger too much on this, but um, basically um, to make one of the points that Keith said again, when you're dealing with something like a DDM ensemble, the typical parameterizations of constraints on your model just are not applicable anymore. A, a plot where you're showing the WIMP mass versus the WIMP nucleon spin independent cross-section, whatever like that, this just doesn't work. Why? Because you don't have a single wind mass. You don't have a single scattering cross-section between your dark matter candidate, which is an aggregate of particles, and your, um, and your and a nucleon, or even a proton and a neutron. You have to parameterize things in different ways. So you can take the bounds, for example, from xenon, um, xenon 100 or Lux or what have you, um, these are for Xenon 100. This was a, back a couple of years ago when these plots were made. And you can show that, um, and basically you, can, you have to translate the constraints into a new language. And um, basically, um, I won't narrate the plot in detail, but just I will assure you that the constraints on the DDA, on everything I'm going to show you from previous dark matter searches, the most stringent bound here um, was Xenon 100, and those are satisfied in what I'm about to show you. So how well, again, the question becomes, can we distinguish a departure from the standard picture um, when versus a DDM ensemble on the basis of direct detection data? So let's, as an example, focus on a particular experiment characterized by certain attributes. And of course, the attributes include things like the tar target material, the detection method, where it's a, whether it's a dual phase liquid detector or whether it's a, um, a single phase or some other thing, the fiducial volume, the data collection time, signal acceptance, recoil energy window, all sorts of stuff. So let's say you have a dark matter experiment that reports a statistically significant excess in the number of signal events, and you go back and reanalyze the recoil energy spectra. What do you? Um, what do you get? How do you do this? Well, we again, the procedure, much like our collider analysis, is we just want to compare the recoil energy spectra for a given ensemble to those of all the traditional dark matter candidates, which could yield the same total event rate at a detector. That's what we, we first measure, right, is the overall event rate. And therefore, that's, that's an overall, that, that's an overall um, constraint that, we, we, that applies to um, our DEM ensemble. We survey over traditional dark matter candidates with different M chi and define a chi squared statistic for each one. And again, the minimum of these is the one that we're going to take as our st st statistical significance of differentiation. OK, so what detector will we pick as an example? Well, um, hmm, let's pick something kind of like xenon 1 ton. Um, for spin independent, um, basically the xenon dual phase detectors are kind of the thing that we want to focus on. So something similar to um, future projections of things like xenon 1 ton, Lux LZ, Panda X. In particular, liquid xenon target, fiducial volume of 5,000 kilograms, five live years of operation, energy resolution effectively taken to be that of xenon 100, and an acceptance window between 8 and 48 keV, again, modeled after Xenon 100, roughly. And you might wonder um, what the background, because of course you have to deal with backgrounds. Well, um, the folks at, um, the folks at uh, Xenon 1 ton have um, calculated what the uh, expected backgrounds um, are for um, all different sorts of background processes. And basically, more or less, they end up being effectively a fairly flat line 
in terms of electron recoil energy, KEV, um, KEVE, that, that equivalent to recoil energy measured in those units, um, versus um, events per day per kilogram. So basically, we have sort of a, a flat kind of background, and now we can look at our signal. And so once again, um, these sort of tomato colored plots are similar to the ones that I showed for um, colliders. Five sigma significance is um, this deep red, and um, other significance levels are shown by orange, yellow, and so on and so forth. I'm plotting things here in terms of M naught, the mass of the lightest, um, lightest constituent versus delta M. And you can see here that, um, again, if I have small M naught, at least, um, so at least one particle is in the low mass regime um, here. Um, if I have delta M being small, um, I have these characteristic OG shapes. This is the region where I have the OG shapes. Um, and can do a very good job of distinguishing um, dynamical dark matter from, tradi from traditional dark matter. Of course, there's a lot of um, substructure of different things here based upon recoil energy thresholds and things like that. But the point is that in this region, you get a high statistical significance. OK, in what, so what is this little lobe about here? Well, what this little lobe about here is here that I'm seeing in both is when I have um, a mass uh, M0 that's, again, pretty light in the light mass regime, something less than around 20 to 30 um, GeV, roughly around here, and a larger delta M, well, this means that I have one particle that's in the low mass regime, and then the next constituent is in the high mass regime, but that's still OK because I can still see a kink. And this is the regime in which I'm starting to see kinks. So um, the point of view, the, the overall point here again is that there are a lot of very interesting regions of parameter space where you can get a five sigma or close to it statistical significance of differentiation um, at the next generation of direct detection experiments. Of course, as an upshot, I, I should say there are discrepancies in recoil energy spectra can also, of course, be due to the halo velocity distribution, velocity-dependent interactions, all sorts of other stuff. But none of, all, none of this all sorts of other stuff is unique to DDM ensembles. Any dark matter candidate, there are always going to be uncertainties. There are always going to be things like that. There are always things you need to take with a grain of salt. But in terms of the effects that are intrinsic to DDM ensembles, I've shown you that there really is a substantial difference in the recoil energy spectra that can be probed experimentally on the horizon. And so, yeah. This is five sigma at next generation for, say, di differentiation of shape or regions of parameter space that are safely undetected at current. That is correct. Yeah, that was, yeah, I, pro I probably didn't say it as well as um, I could have. But the, the, this slide doesn't make it obvious because, of course, we're all used to seeing this and not used to seeing these kinds of plots. But these plots are basically being shown to show, sh shown to show you that everything is consistent with current bounds. So presumably, you're picking a benchmark that's kind of on the boundary. Of yeah, exactly. Because we want to see. Because um, again, um, we're assuming um, that we're getting an eclipse. Yeah, so we're, we're assuming basically that we're getting an overall dent count that's that's again around a thousand events, and and that's exactly kind of the regime that you want to be in. Okay, finally, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to distinguish DDM ensembles with cosmic ray detectors, and in particular, I'm going to focus on posi the positron excess that AMS and a number of other experiments have um, have observed over the past um, decade or so. Um, which explains why I'm showing a picture of AMS bolted to the, uh, um, the International Space Station here. This is based on work that I've done with uh, Keith Dinas and Jason Kumar at the University of Hawaii. So um, as, as a little bit of background, the positron puzzle is, like I said, about a decade old now. Pamela, AMS2, AMS1, a bunch of other experiments have um, seen an excess of cosmic ray, either cosmic ray positrons in the case of Pamela and AMS2, or a, an excess in the total electron plus positron flux in the case of Attic and uh, um, some other balloon experiments. So um, annihilating, or, or, and the question, of, the question is, of course, what is giving rise to um, this anomaly? Well, annihilating or decaying dark matter in the galactic halo has been advanced as one possible explanation. And so dark matter candidates whose annihilations or decays reproduce the observed positron fraction, um, they have been 
people will propose models, but they often, um, these models are very constrained, and even more so now because um, AMS's data is very, the AMS has done some very, very nice work in measuring um, these um, fluxes in a very precise way. And so limits um, on how well you can mock up um, this excess with any given model have gotten more and more and more stringent over the years. Limits on the continue, and furthermore, there are a lot of other limits that you have to correlate with this. Any model that you want that might give you this curve also has to satisfy limits on the continuum gamma ray flux from Fermi. It has to satisfy limits on the cosmic ray anti-proton flux from Pamela. It can't simultaneously re reproduce the totally plus and minus flux um, so, um, sorry, from uh, Fermi, et cetera, or yeah, it, it must to, it, our, our models must, and if they can't do that, that's a problem. They can also leave imprints on the CMB um, that are not observed by WMAP or Planck, um, such as reionizing the, the CMB, which I'll talk a little bit about um, in a couple of slides. DDM ensembles actually can do, go a long way toward re reconciling, the, reconciling these tensions and getting you a model that really does mock up the, um, the observed positron excess um, in a very interesting way. So DDM ensembles and cosmic rays. All right, once again, this is an example. So we will stick to um, having couplings scaling in a similar way that we've talked about before. This time I'm going to call the um, uh, scaling excess for the cou couplings C, like this. Uh, the masses, again, I'm going to assume a uh, similar mass spectrum like this. The abundances, I'm going to use assume a similar scaling of the, ma of the abundances here with the scaling exponent alpha. Um, of course, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I mentioned before is that there are limits on a cosmic ray anti-proton flux. Um, the male and other experiments have imposed some fairly stringent limits. So decays, um, uh, decays of dark matter particles to leptons um, are preferred by anti-proton flux constraints, so we're going to focus on decays to leptons here, um, such as a two-body decay like this. Um, and so one can, um, in particular, it'll turn out that decays to muons end up giving us um, the best results in terms of mocking up the observed spectrum. Um, so um, the <coughs> One can imagine a coupling Lagrangian like this, where a scalar dark matter particle, uh, phi sub n, in a dark matter ensemble, each one couples to um, uh, standard model leptons through an interaction like this, suppressed by, again, some operator scale lambda. These are the coefficients. This is, again, how they scale. And this gives you a uh, decay width um, with um, a, and so the decay width scales um, like this um, with some, um, cut with some, uh, again, power law index gamma, which is just given by 1 plus 2 times C, the coupling scaling index. So distributing um, the dark matter relic abundance across the ensemble is going to lead to a spectrum of, le of lepton injection energies. And um, we're going to see the consequences of that. So again, um, our goal is to survey the parameter space of our DEM model and see how we can get consistency with AMS. Um, consistency with combined, what we um, are going to use as the, our criteria for consistency with observational limits are the follows. Are as follows: We want to be consistent with the um, Fermi combined E plus E minus flux spectrum to within three sigma. Um, AMS has, of course, measured this since we put out the paper, but doing this doesn't change our results really all that much at all. Uh, qualitatively, they still hold. Consistency with diffuse extragalactic gamma ray flux observed by Fermi. Consistency with um, Pamela limits on the anti-proton flux up to three sigma, and consistency with projected Planck CMB reionization limits. Okay, so for each choice of our um, parameters alpha, gamma, and m naught, we're going to survey over values of the lifetime t naught of the lightest of the lightest particle in the ensemble, and identify a value which provides the best fit to the AMS positron fraction using, again, a chi-squared statistic that simultaneously satisfies the above criteria. And then we're interested in the continuum regime in which the mass splitting between all relevant modes is much smaller than the energy resolution of the AMS detector. So we're therefore going to focus on benchmark values delta m equals 1 GeV, so very, very small mass splitting continuum limit. And we're also going to take delta, the um, scaling parameter here, to be equal to 1 throughout our analysis. 
Okay, so first of all, um, just to mention the reionization limits, um, there are um, there are CMB limits um, that are imposed by Planck, WMAP, etc. Um, and the, proje um, the projected Planck limit basically kind of really depends on sort of the sum of the um, gamma gamma n, the uh, decay widths of the uh, of the dark matter particle over n over the different dark matter species weighted by omega, the abundance of each species. And this has got to be less than around 3 times 10 to the uh, minus 26 um, inverse seconds, this C parameter here. And so you can, uh, within tau, tau naught um, alpha plus gamma space, it turns out that the other linear combination alpha minus gamma doesn't matter all that much. Um, basically, this region is excluded here, and so you have a region here where everything is satisfied, everything satisfies all the constraints. And here I'm just showing you the, um, these colors just correspond to different values of C that are consistent with these constraints. So, um, you, and indeed you can, although I'm not going to show it, you can, um, because you're decaying to leptons, you're e easily satisfying um, anti-proton flux constraints, and you can also satisfy um, constraints from Fermi um, gamma rays um, reasonably easily. So, as a result of the softening of the E plus, E minus injection spectra, due to the fact that you have a spectrum of masses, these ensembles can actually reproduce the AMS positron fraction data very well, while simultaneously satisfying all of these constraints. So, um, this, um, what I'm showing here, is, um, so the region of parameter space that's shaded in here, this is M naught on this axis, and this is alpha plus gamma, on this axis here. Um, and again, I'm assuming that phi decays primarily to mu plus mu minus by a two body decay. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, this is for alpha equals minus two, delta m equals one GeV, and delta equals one. Um, so these are, um, these color coded regions correspond to different degrees of discrepancy from the AMS curve. So one sigma de deviation from AMS results is, so very within one sigma is this brown region, and we get all the way to up around five sigma um, in this blue region. So what are these white regions that I'm not shading? These are the regions where, due to some other constraint, Fermi gamma rays, um, reionization limits, something else, things fail. So within these white regions of parameter space, um, things just violate other constraints, this is the region where everything succeeds, and you also get um, and some degree of, of um, agreement quantified by the color here with AMS. So um, the interesting thing is, so you can see here that the best um, region, the, the region of parameter space where things go the best in terms of mocking up AMS, is the region where M naught is between around 200 and 800 GeV, right here. Um, and thus, when a substantial number of the ensemble constituents here, because M naught is pretty small, are relatively light. So this helps ease tensions with uh, gamma ray constraints relative to traditional dark matter models, which tend to end up having to have M chi be around 1 to 3 TeV in order to mock up these curves. Brooks, I have a dumb question. Yeah, uh, sure. I'm not sure if this makes sense, but so basically the mass is, let's say, a TeV. Mm -hmm. I should have a non-normalizable operator that appears in the theory for, okay, so this is the oscillating scalar we have that's mass as a TV. So shouldn't that scalar have a, at least a gravitational coupling because we can't prevent it, it would make it decay about the time of big bang nucleosynthesis. But you're wanting it to decay today to explain the positron axis. Am I saying that right? Or? Right. So these the these heavy so the heavy guys here basically what we did was look at different regions of the ensemble when things decay and when things were when things were bad. It turned it turns out that for things with the lifetime regime, and I was about to say, are we? Um, let's see. So let me um, show you. Um, the, yeah, this is the slide I want to show. So. Tau naught is the lifetime of the of the lightest guy, and so we're we're really sort of starting um, in the ensemble here with tau being with tau naught being around um, ten to the twenty fifth g ten to the twenty fifth seconds, so something very 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 pr pretty long, and tau naught generally needs to kind of be in kind of be in this range. 
So the, the constraints from reionization, which are turn out to be the leading constraints, leading over the constraints from BBN and the constraints from um, other CMB issues on dark matter decays from the, from the heavy guys, um, which are all being, all being included into this computation of C. This is where those constraints fail. So, the, the, so while there are additional particles that do have, of course, larger decay widths, um, the cons their abundances are small enough so so here for constraints. So protecting it from decaying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thanks. OK, so the interesting thing is not only can, not only can um, we satisfy AMS and all of the other constraints, but also because of the way the, because of the way, because the DDM ensemble itself has a particular scaling relation associated with it, because there's a particular method to the madness of how couplings and masses are distributed, the way those couplings and masses are distributed in order to make in order to achieve consistency with AMS, you get a very taut constraint on what needs to happen to the higher modes, the ones you have not yet probed at AMS. AMS data goes up to, um, up to around here, a um, couple of hundred GeV, so far 350 GeV. At higher masses, where AMS will eventually probe up to around a TeV, what happens with DDM ensembles is that the constraints essentially force you, instead of having at higher, um, at higher energies, the kind of abrupt downturn that you associate with traditional dark matter models of the positron excess. You end up having, at, at, at worst, a kind of gradual downturn like this, or something that looks almost completely flat at high energies. So really, this um, and all basically all of the um, benchmark models in our survey here that, that satisfied all of these constraints, all of these have basically been plugged in, and all of these curves are all of the models that within within different regions of parameter space and the the um, the uh, um, <clears throat> sorry the um, positron fractions that they yield. All of it, so it's very difficult to get something outside of this narrow fan here. And that's the point. For a DDM ensemble, there is a really distinctive prediction at high energies as to what the positron um, fraction should do. And again, it's, this is, stands in stark contrast to traditional dark matter models in which you expect not a plateau or a gradual decline, but a precipitous drop off at around the, the mass cutoff, the cutoff associated with the mass of the, the particle. You're right. <laughs> okay. So, again, there's always, like, like with the uh, dynamic, <laughs> like with the um, direct detection stuff, there's always a caveat. And the caveat I want to mention here is, of course, as you guys pointed out, pulsars. Question, so, can a population of pulsars reproduce exactly the same positron fraction curves? Yeah, yeah. Can a population of pulsars reproduce essentially any curve you want? Yeah, pretty much. But, so, so while of course there are always there there is always this pulsar hobgoblin lurking over any possible dark matter explanation of the positron excess, the point is that a large number of positron fraction curves, which one might thought could be reproduced by pulsars only, where if you saw this, it's a pulsar. End of story. Dark matter is not responsible for. So I have a quick question. You yeah. sort of have one word, but I don't see the sentence I wanted. So, don't we know that this is isotropic on the sky, and pulsars would be anisotropic, and so that's sort of evidence it can't be a pulsar. Okay. Well, the, the thing. Statuses. Okay. Well, the thing is, the the issue is. Okay. So positrons. So, so first of all, when people say pulsars, pulsar models, of course, this is a population of different pulsars on the sky that, that are collectively giving rise to whatever curve this is. All right. Well, of course, pulsars are collections of objects at different places in the sky. So normally, one would, ex nor I mean, in principle, one there, there is an anisotropy of emitters. The problem is 
unlike something like gamma rays, which are a very, gamma rays, if I emit a gamma ray, it goes, maybe it interacts with, you know, some electrons or something in the, I, in the uh, ISM, but really pretty much it gets to us, maybe it's spectrum, it gets degraded. Galactic magnetic fields don't screw with photons. Galactic magnetic fields screw a lot with electrons and positrons. But, but, but okay, okay. I, that, I mean, the electrons that we reach the detector are only three kiloparsecs away, so there's not much screwing. With, whereas with antiprotons, you know, they're okay. Yes, quite right. Hard. There are a few papers who studied the nearby Vegas and the hazards, and we can see. Was the current conservation is not up there? Yet. Yeah, no, no. Like in next right. four years, so we're right. going to bring you to talk about. Okay, so, that's so it's a, yeah. yeah, so hence, <laughs> hence <laughs> this sentence um, okay. that probing anisotropies could potentially help. And we again, like like you, I think you were you were saying a minute ago. Within the next few years, there is going to be hopefully a possibility to do a little bit more directional resolution. So we may actually be able to distinguish this versus DDM. While we're on the actually, we should point out that when we said a more optimistic that the, that this would be a way to do it, the referee for our paper said, "Oh, it's wonderful. You should publish it." But have them take out that sentence. We don't like that because he felt that it was not. This obviously was an expert in this. That that the pulsar, that the anisotropy uh, still wouldn't be able to do. Yeah. We, There's a lot of debate on whether the pulsar data really so is. So did your paper? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know Stefano has a big crime hat. Uh, the other question I had is, do people, have you looked at this, uh, uh, especially since you have the spectrum that flattens out, so mm -hmm. you're going to higher and higher energy, there's these synchrotron constraints that people used to put on these things. So we have the like, synchrotron map from WMAP, and we can put a constraint on the energy of the, of the positrons to do that. Um, and then we did this for like neutralino dark matter, so basically it kills Venus as an explanation. Okay. Those those constraints do go into our astrophysical analysis. I don't think I don't think they are as severe as certain other things. We included them. Yeah, we, we did include them. Because it seems weird at high energy, you'd think you'd put produce a huge amount of synchrotron in the background that you can use these maps. I mean you can ask how much you trust yeah. the maps, but this would be a lot, right? I mean if, uh, this is the game that uh, right. I did it again tonight. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's decaying. I keep yeah, I'm it's, sorry, I'm sorry. It, exactly, that's, that's what I, no, because it's not decaying. <laughs> yeah, exactly, no, because, yeah, because yeah, it's yeah, decaying, yeah, we've yeah, yeah, had, yeah, like, yeah, Paulo Gondolo and, and the two of us had, like, a 10-minute discussion. It was like, but all of these constraints and all these, the, yeah. oh, it's decaying, yes, okay, okay, yeah, no, yeah so, similar that. thing. Okay, so, in summary, DDM is an alternative framework for dark matter physics in which stability is replaced by a balancing between lifetimes and abundances across this vast ensemble of particles, as Keith discussed. And you can collectively account for omega CDM through this, um, with such an aggregate dark matter candidate. These DDM ensembles give rise to distinctive experimental signatures, and as I've shown, these include, include imprints on kinematic distributions on, of standard model particles of colliders in very mass distributions, and other things like MT2 distributions, all sorts of other things. Um, there'll be a paper coming out in about a week um, where we're looking at some of these other variables. No, we're here for this week. No, we're here for this week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there'll be a paper coming out whenever we can catch our breath and uh, manage to put the paper out. But there are distinctive features in the recoil energy spectrum at direct detection experiments that can be probed for, unusual features in cosmic ray E plus and E minus, and other kinds of spectra at high energies that can be probed for. I haven't even talked about photons, I haven't talked about um, a lot of other stuff. And there are many more phenomenological handles on non-minimal dark sectors that in general remain to be explored. I am not going to talk about, because of time, general non-minimal dark sectors, but we're going to go into very, 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 very brief. I'm going to go in this very briefly. Um, everybody okay with that? Okay. Don't see anybody running out the door. So, so basically, um, another thing that I should mention. I, I said I wasn't going to. I said I uh, before I didn't talk a lot about inelastic scattering, things like that. Other possibilities that open up um, when you have um, a multi-component dark sector. 
Well, there are a lot of different aspects. Okay, if I have multiple different kinds of experimental handles, I should start thinking about complementarity, um, perhaps in a more general way too. And so dark matter complementarity, I mean basically the principle is a single operator that couples dark matter particles to standard model particles generally contributes to a variety of different physical processes. And of course, I'm sure everybody in the room has seen this diagram where you have two dark matter particles and two standard model particles, and going this way is dark matter annihilation, going this way, and when I say going this way, I mean which direction is the arrow of time, going this way is elastic scattering, that's direct detection, going this way is production of colliders, and of course, complementarity, the idea there are really two things you're looking for. First is, if I have some general parameter space that I'm just showing schematically here, first of all, you're interested in how well all of your different experimental handles can cover that parameter space. Are there any stones that are being left unturned, any regions of parameter space which are in which no probe is sensitive, and what are they? And also, correlations, when you have multiple different probes that are sensitive in the same region of parameter space, multiple signals can really do a great job of nailing down what the properties of dark matter are. So, there however is, when you start to think about multi-component dark sectors in general, a more general picture of complementarity that emerges. So, for example, what happens in this diagram where you don't have chi and chi, but chi sub i and chi sub j? Well, one thing um, that really is the crux and the cornerstone of dynamical dark matter is dark matter decay. And, but even in a situation where I have one that maybe even if I do have a stabilizing symmetry that's protecting the lightest dark matter particle, I can still have uh, the, the, this new direction, literally, in complementarity where I have, oh, I'm going along this diagonal here, a heavier dark matter particle decays into a lighter one and a couple of standard model particles. Furthermore, the kinematics of all of the other processes differ too. In um, scattering here, if these masses are different, becomes inelastic, either upscattering or downscattering, as I discussed before, depending on which is heavier, the one coming in or the one coming out. Dark matter production of colliders becomes asymmetric. Of course, the mass splitting between these two has to be big enough um, for that to matter. Um, but, in, but in principle, it's asymmetric production, as well as cone annihilation processes between chi i and chi j in the early universe and today in the galactic halo. So that affects indirect detection and it affects abundances. So the, again, um, just to sort of um, show an example, um, so the fundamental interactions um, <clears throat> in which are leading to all of these, let's, so let's consider, um, so first of all, um, one observation that um, a lot of people um, have, including uh, Goodman et al, um, have, have um, used to make a lot of a lot of hay in terms of analyzing dark matter models in a relatively model independent way, is that the energy scales relevant for direct detection, this is um, energy transfers of less than around 100 MeV um, between dark, dark and visible sectors, in a wide variety of theories can be modeled as effective contact interactions if whatever mediator mediates the interaction between standard model and, and um, standard model sector and dark sector has a mass greater than this. So, as an example, um, let's consider a dark matter sector comprising two direct fermions, let's call them chi 1 and chi 2, not a huge whole dynamical dark matter ensemble, but one can extrapolate. Let's just focus on a two-component system for now, just to isolate some of the behaviors. Um, M2 we'll consider to be greater than M1, and the dominant couplings to the visible sector are through standard model quarks, through some operator like this, where it's, um, this is a four Fermi interaction, and again, lambda is the operator suppression scale, the C are operator coefficients, and this capital gamma is just some um, Clifford algebra watch of matrices, something like that. So for purposes of illustration, we're going to focus on um, the, an interest, particularly interesting case um, where downscattering, scattering from a heavier state to a lighter state, um, dominates. We're going we're gonna to assume that a single operator with i not equal to j, so chi 1 and chi 2 are these two particles, dominates, and that um, the scattering of, and that the, the um, coefficients for the processes for one and, where this is 1 and 1 and where this is 2 and 2 um, are for all operators with i equal j um, are essentially zero. We'll assume that the majority of the dark matter is in the metastable state, so omega dn is omega 2, and we'll assume that the, uh, these quark couplings here are flavor universal and order 1 up to an overall ratio between up and down type quarks, which we can parameterize 
via sort of a coupling angle here. So coupling to uptight and coupling it down to kind of quarks go like this. And the uh, mass splitting will define between one and two will define as M2 minus M1. So for downscattering, it's going to be positive. Okay, so um, inelastic scattering um, has very different kinematics, of course, from elastic scattering, um, as I'm showing here. And it can have a significant impact on direct detection signals when delta M12 is in a range of recoil energies to which these experiments are sensitive, and that's between around 1 and 100 keV. So what I'm showing here um, in, in this plot, just to kind of illustrate the differences, is um, so these, um, the solid lines um, shown in these plots, these are basically, this is the velocity um, over the speed of light of a dark matter particle on the halo, and this is the recoil, um, recoil energy that, that part, the, the range of recoil energies to which a particle with that velocity can give rise, depending on the scattering angles. Okay, so for um, elastic scattering, basically I have a oblique line here, but the point is that for inelastic scattering, if I have upscattering, scattering of a lighter guy to a heavier guy, um, I have this sort of bell shape here, and if I have the even more interesting case where I have downscattering, I have this sort of funnel behavior where even if I have very, very low velocity dark matter, I can still scatter off an atomic nucleus um, and, and get some very, very narrow range of, of recoil energies. And this is because, in this case, your dark matter is exothermic. You're, rele you're, you're releasing energy, and basically you're putting that into the, the nucleon system, and this is what you get. So um, these, of course, give rise to very distinctive recoil energy distributions. You can see that the dotted curves, again, these correspond to downscattering, and the solid curves correspond to upscattering, black is elastic, differ quite a bit from each other. And therefore, once again, as we've seen, um, one, one can, through analyzing um, the uh, re recoil energy spectra that one gets out of direct detection experiments, go a long way to discerning different features in multi-component scenarios. So you can try to discern one of these shapes from the other. However, um, there's that other direction of complementarity I talked about, dark matter decays. And so um, in this case, in the delta M12 regime relevant for um, um, dark matter scattering off of nuclei inelastically, um, this, is, this is around order 1 to 100 keV. So I'm, that's a mass splitting that's much lighter than the mass of any hadron that um, I have in my system. So basically, and even any lepton I have in my system, that's, that's less than 2 times 5 over 511 keV. So only photons and neutrinos are accessible in these decays. Um, however, even when chi 1 and chi 2 couple primarily to quarks through that operator that I showed, there are still contributions to the decay width of chi 2 that generally arise from diagrams involving virtual quarks and hadrons. One can model this via, for example, chiral perturbation theory and, the, and get out and basically analyze processes that involve contact operators um, and off-shell pion type processes um, that can give you decays to um, pairs of photons and um, also even to single photons, but um, here I'm going to focus on a couple of particular operator structures. In particular, the scalar-scalar um, operator structure, and again, what I mean by scalar-scalar is that this big gamma is 1 and this big gamma is 1, and um, for axial-axial, oops, for axial-axial, that big gamma is gamma mu gamma 5. So in each of these cases, um, the lowest order process involves two photons. I have decay width contribution, um, decay width contributions here. And the important thing to note is that the spectrum is peaked in the X-ray um, for delta M12 being on this order. So widths are constrained by diffuse X-ray data from integral, from HAL, from CompTEL, from all of these experiments. So how does the picture of complementarity look like in a multi-component dark matter scenario? Well, it kind of looks literally like this. Here are some pictures. The interplay between um, detection channels, direct and indirect, um, actually is, it's, it's really interesting because up, for, um, up until about the um, level, up until about the, um, around lambda equals 10 to the 3 GeV, or around the TeV range to which experiments are now sensitive, 
Um, we're just exiting the region which for small couplings, or, or so, sorry, small gamma or, or um, larger couplings, um, both indirect and direct detection experiments would have been um, sensitive within the same region of parameter space. Um, these purple, um, purple are the leading diffuse X-ray background limits from integral. Heyow gives you this less constrained yellow blob. And the appropriate um, direct detection limit, so this is the scalar-scalar, this is the axial vector-axial vector, -axial vector um, um, interaction, and so this is the leading interaction here is spin independent, the leading interaction here is spin dependent, and so the bounds are from Luxon and uh, LZ 7.2 liter experiment is the, is the sort of next generation reach um, for the corresponding limits and next generation reach for axial axial are from uh, KU4 and uh, PICO 250L and uh, the um, constraints from colliders um, yeah, are shown for um, mono jet and mono WZ um, limits in by these vertical lines here. Why are these lines vertical? Because the ma a mass splitting that small doesn't matter for colliders. It might as well be pair producing the same particle. So there's essentially no sensitivity to delta m here. However, um, the interesting thing is that um, again, complementarity coverage of parameter space for um, large couplings or small lambda is essentially perfect for um, less than around a TeV. We are just now, however, getting into a region of parameter space for large lambda or small couplings where a region of a little gap in parameter space opens up here between the regions in which direct detection and indirect detection are sensitive. So there's a little place where um, a pair of dark matter particles that scatter inelastically could hide, for example. And one of the important things as we move forward in terms of both indirect and direct detection experiments, we'll be trying to figure out ways, or other experiments too, of plugging this kind of gap that emerges um, between direct and indirect detection in terms of um, not quite perfect complementarity. So um, just as a summary of uh, this last little end note, in, in multi-component theories of dark matter, there exist new complementarity relations because there are new processes. There, in, in particular, there are decays uh, which exist between um, particles that are not that are absent in single component theories. In particular, um, also the kinematics of scattering is different. It can be inelastic, and um, asymmetric production of colliders is also a possibility. Of course, in certain regimes, um, it doesn't matter. We've just demonstrated the. Um, so we've demonstrated the power of these complementarity regions in covering the parameter space of a two-component dark sector. In particular, in the small coupling large lambda regime, there's, um, um, sorry, in the, yeah, in the large coupling small lambda regime, sorry, fix that, there is significant overlap between the regions excluded by direct and indirect detection limits, and so these probes are really complementary from here. By contrast, in the small coupling large lambda regime, fix that, a range of M12 opens up in which the dark sector escapes detection, and this motivates new detection strategies to kill the gap. So, thanks, no more addenda.